Welcome to our class on content management. When I think about content, I think about books. And I, in essence, this class is goodbye to documents, hello to objects. And when we work on an architecture for our site or struggle to cobble together a content management system, we often focus more on the electronic objects than the people who create or exchange them. I'm thinking of the whole range of communicative objects, XML entities, elements, graphic inserts, web pages, emails, chat messages, discussion threads, menu systems, search results. When we focus too much on these objects, we get clumsy. I think part of the reason for our awkwardness is that we're still thinking in ways we learn from paper. Now we must begin to detach ourselves from a model of communication based on paper. Now, paper is a great tradition. Paper brings us the Word of God and the New York Times, authority with a capital A, science, literature, contracts, laws. If it's on paper, it has the imprimatur of a culture, and it's become ubiquitous. Think about the physical characteristics of paper. Paper is cheap, easy to recycle, durable, portable, stable. If you put it on a shelf and your roof doesn't leak, the text will still be readable 10, 15, 100 years later. Unlike that text you left on that floppy disk 10 years ago or the zip disk for which you no longer have a drive. The book is the apotheosis of paper. Books appear at the top of the Mount Olympus of paper. Thanks to its media, ink, cardboard, thread, paper, all neatly bound into a single package. The book has become a robust, mature, heavily tested, nicely debugged interface. It's solid, compact, long-lasting. Even the most incoherent book has a conceptual unity, we believe. And when we're reading a book, we can immerse ourselves in the writer's being, absorbing the idea, seeing as the writer saw things, feeling as the writer felt, across space, beyond death. Milton's Paradise Lost is the lifeblood of a master spirit. Me, I've always loved books. Reading them, even as a kid, made me feel less alone, as if I were in intimate, almost psychic contact with another person, with a depth I rarely felt in ordinary life. When I was 10 or 11, a faculty brat at the prep school Hotchkiss, I and my friends would go into the dumpsters in the dormitories just after the students left. The rich kids would not bother packing. They'd just shove stuff down the chute. So we jumped into the bins that were made out of wood and chicken wire, and we hauled out treasures. Some of them were covered with hair tonic. Others were wrapped in school reports and old newspapers. I remember Bill used to grab batteries and sweaters. Charlie got baseballs and footballs, and I went for the books. At one point, I had 12 copies of King Lear in a nice blue binding, and six copies of Giants in the Earth, and four copies of A Bell for Adano. I had no idea what I was going to do with more than one copy. I just liked owning them all, feeling the texture of the binding, flipping the thick pages, arranging them along the front edge of the shelf. Later, when I was in finishing graduate school, I turned down chances to teach at Berkeley and Penn. I preferred a spot in the Department of Drama at New York University because I wanted to be in the same city as the book publishers. Since then, I've written or edited more than 30 books with regular publishers, not to mention dozens of manuals. But now I say that we have to go beyond books. Why is that? Well, Basically, people want conversations. And for all of the mind melt that goes on when we read a book, the main trend of the communication is from author to us, more like a sermon than a discussion. Now, with the shift in media toward electronics, we can offer an interchange that comes closer to the real give and take of conversation. Despite the coldness of the computer, we're seeing new genres such as the FAQ, and transformed activities like discussions, chats, instant messaging, 
all made possible by the move toward electrons away from paper. I think we're going through a major shift in the media. I believe this shift is similar to the change that Gutenberg launched when his movable type made printing on paper a viable economic activity. Without stretching too far, we can say that printing accelerated cultural changes, such as the Reformation, popular revolution, public education, public libraries, the rise of the press. But why would a simple act like changing the medium in which we communicate lead to such widespread changes? When we change the medium in which we communicate, we pretty soon change the tools we use. We change the way we work. We turn out new kinds of content in this new medium. Our idea of what we do necessarily changes. And after working in the new medium for a while, we discover that our own roles have changed. We've come to a new sense of who we are. We've seen this kind of transformation when video broke free from the TV studio, when music became digital, when fiction became hypertext. The media shift we're experiencing now reminds me of something that my old Latin teacher, Eric Havelock, used to talk about, and he called it the making of the Western world. He felt that what really made writing a practical means of communication for most people in the West with the idea of some Greek in the 7th or 8th century. That person came up with the idea of inserting vowels into the consonantal clusters that the Jews and Arabs had already concocted as a form of writing. Now, even a merchant or a politician could read and write word by word. You no longer had to be a priest or a scholar to make sense of these markings. You could put down your thoughts and analyze them the way Aristotle did. But many folks hated writing and everything it brought to their culture. In these scrolls, people were writing down whole speeches, as well as warehouse inventories, contracts, laws, military orders. Socrates never learned to write, though all his students were doing so. In the Phaedrus, Plato writes a book in the form of a dialogue, imagining his old master Socrates taking a walk outside of the city, getting his bare feet wet in the stream, lounging under a tree with his student Phaedrus. Phaedrus has been so impressed with the flowery speech that he tried to memorize it, but he couldn't. So, to learn it by heart, he borrowed the book. Socrates scoffs at the book, saying it cannot talk back. It lacks what we would call bandwidth, or interactivity. You can't have a Socratic dialogue with a book. So, Socrates sketched out an informal, what we would call taxonomy of conversations. Any human conversation is better than a book. But the best conversation for most people is between two lovers who see in each other the divine spark. Their souls recall what they saw as souls before entering the body, and they become inflamed. Superior to the conversation of lovers, though, is that dialogue between a spiritual master and the student. Plato's own students must have asked him why he was writing a book when his own master disapproved the book so much. And his reply at the end of the dialogue seems to be that the book can be amusing and it may remind them of what they actually experienced when he was talking to them in person, soul to soul. So a book, even in the form of dialogue, is only a reminder of the real conversation. Ironically, now our electronic form of communication comes closer to a real conversation with its give and take. And I, I think part of the reason why people like these interactive forms so much is that there's a conversational flavor to them. To participate more, to join the conversation, I think we need to learn to detach ourselves from books and the contracts that come with them. And we need to start thinking in terms of content. Goodbye to books and hello content. Moving beyond paper means we set our structure in motion. We get closer to our customers. We adapt faster. We can customize for a group or for an individual. So we're saying goodbye to a whole number of ideas. Goodbye to covers. 
like on a book. The size of our content is no longer fixed. We no longer know what the beginning and the end is. Our content expands, changes shape, reduplicates. We just don't know what's going on in our site. It expands like that. So, hello, unpredictability. Will one menu item lead to one page or a thousand? How many my home pages are there to start from? There's no end. So, hello, questions. How much information lies behind a link? Have I reached the end of this? Is there a conventional structure in here somewhere? We're saying goodbye to the table of contents as well. The idea that there's a single way of structuring all the content and only one way through it. Now we have multiple menus. Menus customized for groups. Different paths for different individuals. Look at the back of the book. We're saying goodbye to the index. One hierarchical list that would point to everything important in the book. That's gone. The equivalence just doesn't exist. We have a site map. We have searches, but searches are not the same as an index. An index gives us a hierarchical view of content and adds value, whereas a search tends to be a more or less random, slightly prioritized list of hits. We're not able to get a grasp of the whole thing the whole site, the whole content that we're producing. With a book, you could flip through and get a general impression. But now, with a site, we can't flip through it. No one person can see it all. Um, on one site, the, like the Cisco site, they have a 15 million pages on the site and 750,000 new pages every month. That means no one person can see everything, control everything. There's no one voice. There's not a coherent picture in the sense of one author controlling the whole thing. There's also no longer page numbers. There's no fixed sequence. There's nothing above or below. There's nothing next or previously. So, in a way, the, the single sequence gave us a, a, a path through, but now we have many paths through the material. And that's because it's not a single document, it's content. And as we get rid of the book way of thinking, we get rid of some kind of artificial units, like the idea of a chapter. What the heck is that? There's no... It's some kind of artificial module. Um... And as we get rid of chapters, we get rid of things like the chapter overview, the, the cross-references for that chapter, the, or in a textbook, the review, the quiz, um, exercises that relate to that chapter. We're welcoming a world of components. So the same procedure may appear in many different places. It may be the endpoint of a lot of different paths. It's the target of a lot of different menu items. It's part of many different modules. Whereas in a book, you would have had to put it once in one position and rely on lame cross-references or indexing to get to it in other ways. Here, because it's electronic, it's content, it's just a small piece. It can be put in apparently everywhere, even though we're actually pointing to a single file or a single object uh, somewhere in a database. So now we've, we've come to the world of objects, individual units of content assembled in many different patterns. Each object has a role to play. It has a specific formal purpose to answer some type of question from the users. We're getting rid of objects that we added just to prop up the book design. Like, if I put in a header, heading, and then I have another smaller level heading, the book designer always told me I had to write a paragraph in between, because it would look bad if the two headings were in order. We don't care about that so much on the web. 
we no longer have to write transitions between two sections that were poorly related. We don't have to justify chapters. We can get rid of a lot of dud content. Oddly, we become more conscious of structure than in the past. We can't get away with smoothing things over with, oh, by the way, and as you remember, and so on. When we create a new object, we have to be aware of its type and its purpose and its structure. The way we do content objects using XML and with tagging, we're reminded of what kind of content we're creating. For every object, we have to be aware, what's this a component of? Is it an optional component or is it a required one? What objects come before or after it? What components might this one include? In other words, objects nested within objects. How many instances of this object can we put in this position? And all of these structural issues are enforced by software. There are rules and we have to follow them. We have less opportunity for originality, for creativity, for wandering off the reservation. We can't pretend we're following the rules in the style book when we're really not. So there's less personal choice for authors, less improvisation. And that's the world of content. But we also get to reuse items. Part of the economic value of going to content management is that uh, corporations can fire writers because they don't have to rewrite the same thing. They just reuse it. So it's not just offshoring, but content management that's leading to fewer jobs for writers, editors, and even for managers. From an economic point of view, that's a big cost saving. And so we are having to write objects that can be reused and in, a, in circumstances we don't even know. We can't pretend to anticipate what pattern this little object will be fitted into. So what does it mean for an editor? It means as an editor, we have to edit for function, not style. What's the purpose of this object? What is it supposed to do? How is it supposed to be organized? Tone becomes less important. Tone is less coherent. Tone is chaotic. Tone is staccato. It's this piece of information and that piece of information. So we're not creating a flow of musical tones the way we may have thought of writing when we were first getting started. We're building a structure more out of Legos. What pieces fit together modularly? We work in a database, not in a document. We update continuously. We don't do a release, then wait two years and do a new release, or wait six months and do a new update. We update every day, every week. Scheduling is, around, is not around releases. It's around whenever users ask for more information. We, are not, we never wait until we're complete. It's always on the fly, just in time, flowing, on and on. More and more, we're responding in this world of content. We don't publish anymore. We simply respond to demand. Customers are driving our work more and more. We get an email with our name on it. We, go, we have to participate in chats. We have to moderate discussion lists. We get web stats showing our uh, audience reaction to our material. Increasingly in this world, writers are measured by what they do for users, not by page count, getting a release out on time, not by completed books, not by completed help systems. We are just part of a process. In the content world, we are never done. Adding, retiring content, repurposing content, rearranging content, learning more about our users. We no longer put out a product. We are part of a process. And we mix content for different groups. We emphasize what they care about, we create new content for them, such as examples, case studies, white papers. But we let individuals choose which content they want, which objects, what type of content they want. Do you want uh, examples with that procedure or not? Do you want introductions or not? 
You can leave those out now because we can identify them as separate types of content and we can allow you the choice to do that. So in this sense, customers are now co-authors. They're picking and choosing the content they want and building documents that we never heard of, that we wouldn't have imagined, that we might think are less than optimal, but are just what they want. So we, as writers, managers, editors, have less control. We may set up firm, formal structures to channel the flow and standard patterns, such as document type definitions and schemas. We can consistently apply metadata. We are basically creating a system in which thousands of people can contribute bits of content. And so we're no longer the sole creators of the content. We're outnumbered. We are no longer the sole authorities. We are not authors in the sense of the authority. We affect the flow, but we don't turn it on and off, and we can barely channel it. We are swimming in a world of complexity, and complexity theory describes what we are doing when we create, say, an enterprise website, both internal and external. In complexity theory, small actions, such as clicking a link to go somewhere, when multiplied by millions, on a huge scale, lead to emergent behavior. And emergent behavior surprises it. Is it shows us things that just knowing you click and go wouldn't have told us. Um, and the, the analogy that the, the theorists like to use is knowing that water evaporates and leads to wind hardly prepares you to face the fact that it produces hurricanes. Hurricanes are emergent behavior. So we watch our site or the web and we see emergent behavior, things that happen with no one forcing them. They're not controlled. Areas expand or contract. Activities start up. They're totally unplanned. The system seems to have a life of its own. In this sense, we are floating together with all of the other people who are contributing content. It is a large conversation that takes on a life of its own. And in saying that we can manage content, we're exaggerating. We are, at best, joining a very complex conversation and perhaps facilitating a conversation. But we have to listen as well as speak. And that's part of the excitement and the challenge of content. Thank you.